Yeah, hi, I'm Chris. Um, I work at Oracle, and I'm going to give you um, a lightning, under 10 minutes, hopefully, if I don't ramble, uh, talk about GraalVM. Um, has any, anybody heard about it? No? I, I come from a Java background, so it's kind of more common to for people to know about it there. But basically, it's a new um, language runtime from Oracle. It's an extension to the existing you know, Java hotspot runtimes, which people have been running Java programs on for years. It comes in an open source, completely open source, community supported version, as well as a, you know, an enterprise one for those who want extra features. But it's got some interesting and exciting features in it that I thought might be interesting to people here today. They might not be. <laughs> Do tell me at the end. Um, I have to put a safe harbor statement on the front because I work for Oracle. So nothing in this talk can be taken at like exactly indicating what Oracle will do, but I'm sure you've seen those before. So uh, what, what is GraalVM and uh, why should you care? I know why I care, but uh, why do you care? Well, basically, it's, it's, it's kind of a concept of a universal language runtime. So the world is changing. People are running applications or building stacks out of lots of different kinds of programming languages for lots of different reasons. You might have Go, you might have Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Java, and they've all got their place and they've all got their own specific set of things they're good at and some things they're less good at. So the world's changing and people are starting to program in lots more technologies. So the idea behind Graal, one of the ideas behind Graal was that we could build one language runtime that enables you to put many languages and support many ways of programming on top of it and to make them all fast because we can use the Java technology, the JIT technology within the Java runtime to make things very, very fast. And I'll explain how, that, how we do that a little bit. But basically, it currently supports fully Node, JavaScript, Java, obviously, Python 3 to a large extent, Ruby is almost complete, R is you know, fast along the way to being available. Um, and it runs faster than like the GNU implementation of R. You can run C on it, lots of different languages, and they can all interop. So you can have uh, a Java program using JavaScript, calling JavaScript, or you can build an express node app into which you can natively just include some Java, and the, the node runtime that comes with Graal will sort out how all of that magic happens. Basically, your Java objects that you create are usable, and you don't have to do any kind of clever unboxing. There's no marshalling or anything like that. So there you go. There's a little picture to show you just how wonderful it is in the world of Graal. Yeah, we've got node support. So 12.14, I think, isn't it? Yeah, is the current version that we, we ship with in the latest version. Uh, 2019, you know, script support with some features of 2020. We're constantly adding new features and trying to make things as standard compliant as possible. We test against like 10, oh sorry, 100,000, it was 90 something thousand last time, 100,000 NPM packages of which like 90% pass with no errors at all. And there are some, that, there are some slight differences between Node and our version of Node, but that's to do with very sort of internal stuff and usually won't affect you if you're using kind of user, what I think of as user space type libraries, packages. Performance wise um, for the Node runtime, it, because it's a JIT technology, it warms up, so it pays attention to what you're doing, what environment it's executing, and what data is coming through, and it makes assumptions about your code, you know, what's going to run, what's not going to run, and that's how it allows it to optimize it and make it fast. So V8 is always going to be faster straight up, but given, given some warm-up time, some exposure to your data, the performance currently of the node runtime should start to match the V8 runtime. So, and, and it's an area that we're, you know, performance is something that we take very seriously, and it's like one of the, mi the main, like, you know, selling points of the runtime, that and bringing lots of languages together. So I expect that to improve. You can find out about the compatibility. We, we test using um, this particular compatibility index test set of test tools to find out what works, what doesn't work, and they are all in the, you know, very standards-based. Uh, the architecture. So underneath, you've got basically what you'd consider um, like classic Java, like a VM that provides your interface to the outside world. You know, how do you talk to file systems? How do you do threading? How do you talk to the OS? And within that, you have like a JIT compiler. This is the thing that makes your code fast. This is the, uh, so typically when you load a Java program, like one of these 
JVM languages. You, when you compile them, you generate like what's called bytecode. It's an intermediate representation of your program. And there's a, an interpreter which will just trundle through those, it's relatively slow but starts quickly. And that, that will execute your program. But the, 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 the VM will watch and profile what's happening. It will notice which things are running many times, which, which, which pieces of code are very tight loops, etc. And it will pass those over to the just-in-time compiler, which will generate optimized machine code for it. And by slowly, over time, noticing which things need speeding up, it will optimize them into native machine code. And that's how you get your speeding improvements. The, the, the secret source, the magic, I suppose might interest people here, is this language implementation runtime. They've, they've abstracted away the idea of creating languages. In, in uh, Antelar, does anybody remember that? You know, or any of the other tools for create, creating grammars for languages, uh, programming languages. They've abstracted all of that, those kind of ideas into a single language implementation layer with underneath it a shared object model. So if you're creating um, some JavaScript and some R, the underlying objects that hold your code or your data, they're all in the same space. They're all the same kind of things. And it's, there's almost like zero interop from swapping you know, an object in your R program into your JavaScript program, which allows you to do some interesting things, especially in terms of like everyone's building lots of applications where you've got an app here and it talks over some kind of queue to something else and that talks over, you know, and they've got a bit of rest and a bit of whatever and it gets very complicated and that's why people invent things like Kubernetes, you know, and Jaeger and things like that. But, you know, maybe we could, maybe one of the ways to use Graal is that to go back to maybe a bit of a monolith style programming model where you use the right kind of tools but all in the same net, um, address space. So you can have your Java in there, you can have your JavaScript in there. And I'll show you, it's a f fairly trivial example of this in a second. <sighs> Wonderful slide that shows you all the different ways, you, different environments you can target. So you can target, you know, like a Java type environment with the, the, um, the Graal VM runtime. You can run it on Node, our version of Node. It's embedded in the Oracle database now as well. We've um, got a thing called the multi-language environment, which lets you, lets you run JavaScript and Python. It's not yet released fully, but it's experimental lets you run any of these languages directly in the database on your SQL queries. So instead of fetching data, shipping it to a server, doing some kind of processing logic there, the idea is that you know, it's all co-located inside the database. The data is not being shipped across the network. And the idea is, hopefully, there will be returns on that and that there's less stuff being shifted around, faster response times. Maybe we could do more with you know, the data. Oh, and we can also generate uh, Linux and Mac executables. Not yet with the host languages, but that's coming soon, JavaScript, R, Python. But if any of your JVM languages, you can take a Java runtime and a Java program, which might total four or 500 meg, megabytes in size, and you can shrink it down to like 10 meg, 10, 50, some, somewhere in the 10 to 50 meg um, size, limp, size range um, and make a Linux executable of it that starts like near, with near instantaneous startup times, reduced memory footprints. And from a security point of view, it's also really interesting because you can chuck away a lot of things. You don't need like a runtime. You just have this one possibly statically linked executable that has no dependencies on anything else. So you, in a container kind of world, you can, you can make very simple containers with your running system in it. And we hope to have that for Node and JS you know, sometime, I think, in the next year. And as an example, like this is just a node, bit of node, I, I think it expresses it or something. Um, I pulled off the web and stuck it into um, our node implementation, ran it, and it, and it worked. NPM works, and you know, there's a bit of setting up command line options, et cetera, you know, various environment variables to point to the right version of node. But you can still use NPM. You can still use any of the tools that you normally use, and, and node works. And as an example of uh, like interop, this is a bit of a controller from uh, a really great web app I wrote. I'll show you it in a second. You'll be bowled over. Um, basically, this, this is just grabbing a bunch of poor images I downloaded off the internet. And against each image, and you could argue about the way I'm doing this all day. I'm sure it's not the best way. But it loads uh, a Java 
object here, which is another Java program I wrote separately and compiled and stored as a jar. And, and this loads uh, a TensorFlow model that classifies images. It turns out classifies images badly, but I haven't got around to finding another model yet. Um, too many other things to do. But this, this, this whole separate Java program I wrote, which works independently, I, I can, by just adding like a, a way to call it as a library, basically, just adding a bit of extra boilerplate, I can now just drop it into my Node application, and that Java object just can be used. There's no funny business. It just works. And when I call it further down here, classifier, classify, and then pass in a JavaScript string, it does its business. And I'll show you the app first because it's incredible. Basically, it was a really poor image gallery um, application, half stolen, but the credits are in the source code. And, the, and also, like any good you know, consultant, I stole the, <laughs> stole the code for, um, well, I say stole, the, the, the accreditation's in there, um, the code for the uh, image classification. And as, as, you, as it loads the gallery, it tries to classify the images. And let's see how it did. Giant panda is pretty good. Cheeseburger's pretty good. Suit, not too bad. He was a famous 80s uh, magician whose name I can't remember. Keeps bugging me. Pil and it gets progressively worse, right? But basically, you see the idea that the, the Java application and the, the JavaScript application are playing nicely together. And I've taken two things that were written independently and been able to stick them together with relative ease. So the last two things I'm going to quickly show you. Um, so this is... Uh, an example of another way of calling other languages. So we have the idea of host languages. These are languages that are implemented on top of the truffle layer. So from one host language to another, there's this polyglot object that we've created that's in Node, and it lets you evaluate um, code. Admittedly, this is passed in as a string, and, and maybe in the future, I think we might improve the experience around this. Just like a JavaScript or a you know a val or a val in Emacs or something, you you can eval against a host language. So we've got here just some R code. Now I I don't understand R code, and I don't think this came from somebody far cleverer than me. Um, and I don't pretend to know fully what that's doing, but I can show you an example of an application that um, that uses this. And again, it's I think it's just a little Express app. And if we have a look at the source code. We can see up here, we've got an example of just pulling in Java objects, big integer, for instance, which is a really handy, um, handy class. Tons of obviously you know, production-ready maths classes that are in the Java space that you could take use of, make use of. Sorry. Then we have a bit of evaluation here where we, we call the R language and we basically ask it to generate some SVG of like three-dimensional graph of like some cos and sines and various other things. And that just comes back as text, but it's SVG text. And then in the final bit of the app, the, the response part, we just, for the request, we just send back the text that we've created. And it's really not the prettiest application. But you can see here, you know, this is, this is the Java big integer, like at the top of the application that we called, and boom. And we could do some like really big maths in that. And you know, one of the good things about the, J the JVM is that you have access to a potentially almost like huge um, heap size. Like if you've got a big enough machine, you can have gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of heap space to play with. And then underneath, we've got our SVG plot that was generated by the um, the R host language. So I'd, R's. Apparently really good for doing data science manipulation type things. I, I don't know a lot about it, but I'm sure that's you know, very clever. <laughs> but it shows how you could seamlessly bring one thing into the other. You, do, you might not want to necessarily use, like, some, maybe there's not an equivalent library, say, in JavaScript. But you know, R has a history going back many years of building you know, these kinds of tools. It makes sense to use the right tool for the right job in my mind. You know, it's also quicker. We're, we're forever reinventing the wheel in um, software development. You know, always, you know, we're going to use this library on this runtime or this. It's, it's nice and pragmatic, I think, to be able to pull these different things together and use them appropriately, right? But if you want to get in touch or find out anything more about it, uh, I'm sure these guys will give you my details. No worries. Ho hope that made sense. <laughs>